Hello and welcome to Talking Events, the event industry podcast brought to you by Event Industry News. We are sat in palatial surroundings, um, certainly for this podcast anyway. Um, and that's not to say that the venues that we've used before haven't been great, but we are sat in the superb hospitality and events facilities um, on site at Twickenham Stadium. Um, the hospitality so far that's been extended to us is, is great, so thanks to the guys here. Um, and on with today's episode. Um, we're going to be looking at transforming um, venues into event spaces. Um, fantastic that we're here today because we've got a great example of that on site where we are. But let's introduce our guests first of all before we get on to talking about this particular venue. Um, sitting in the studio, Tom Allen from True Staging joins us. Uh, okay. Tom, welcome to uh, Talking Events. Thanks for uh, being here. Uh, we've got Matt Blood from Twickenham itself, from Twickenham Indeed. Stadium and from the events team here at Twickenham. Correct. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, Kevin Monks from Blackout. Kevin, thanks for joining the podcast today. No problem. And joining us live on the, on the phone uh, from Mobile Promotions, uh, Robin Carlisle should be on the line. Robin, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Joe. Excellent. Right. Um, let's quickly put in context what it is you guys do. So, Tom, let's come to you first of all. Tom from uh, Tr True Staging. Give us a quick overview about what True Staging uh, deliver for the industry. Absolutely. So, True Staging focus on event construction and production. Um, and that can be anything from uh, live event walling uh, and uh, structures, stages, all the way through to, to fashion shows, uh, catwalks, and uh, even shop window displays uh, and that sort of small scale thing. Over to you Kevin, tell us a little bit about Blackout. Blackout, we're a specialist drape and rigging company, so we do rental fabrics as well as bespoke manufactured drapes and we offer a full production rigging service as well as a dry hire of equipment. Excellent. Uh, Robin on the line, tell us a little bit about mobile promotions. Yeah, we're quite diverse, um, as, as uh, your other guests are, obviously. Uh, live events and experiential event activity and tend to focus for the purposes of this type of um, uh, conversation, I guess, in the areas of brand environments, and that's both static and mobile and temporary. Excellent. And rounding our, our panel off today and our start point of today's episode, um, Matt Blood from, from Twickenham, um, Let's start by talking about the types of event that you can host within mm. this, this, this venue um, and perhaps a shift in how you've seen them change and develop in the, in the last two, three, four years. Sure. So I suppose a, a wee bit of context first. We rep or I rep represent the teams who would sell and deliver all of the non-match day events that would take place in the stadium. So that's anything from the facility that you're sitting in now, which is a, a box for 20 to 25 people, all the way through to events where we're taking in... Um, say a thousand plus theatre style which uses our conference centre through to other areas of the stadium which then are a bit more celebratory um, pitch side drinks receptions um, other elements that take part uh, that would form part of a, of a larger event but it is really anything from a small meeting through to a, a messaged event effectively how varied are the actual spaces themselves in <coughs> in terms of what they they offer to an organiser, um, from sure. being a, a, a blank canvas through to something that somebody could pretty much walk into and just utilise straight away? I suppose to the casual observer, um, it is an oversimplification, but the easiest way to think about it from a venue such as ourselves, or albeit an international sports stadium, it's a dedicated event venue. So the two ways to consider it are a live um, conference centre, which is purpose-built, um, dedicated for um, conferencing, exhibitions, smaller events, larger events, anything in between, where the guys sat on the side of me here would, would come in and, and build the necessary elements for, um, for messaged events anyway, where there's um, large staging, large production elements involved. Uh, the other side of the, of the venue is then more, uh, I think as I've alluded to, celebratory type uh, venues effectively within the greater scheme of the venue. So you're walking into a space which isn't necessarily purpose-built for conferencing and exhibitions. It's more either a hospitality or historic or has another lead focus of that space which is then used to a different end. It it's, uh, has a different hook. It can resonate different messaging. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's the line in the sand. It's either very modern, purpose-built, or it's an other which can resonate different messaging, be it celebratory or other. And, and I think the, the perhaps the best way to move it on there from talking about Twickenham 
uh, and what is in essence, I suppose, a, a fixed venue, isn't mm. it? Uh, it, it? Despite its flexibility in the different spaces you've got, Robin um, at Mobile Promotions, y your experience uh, lies with delivering te temporary venues. Is that is that fair to say? And working within a temporary environment? Yes, I think the the roots of the company are in uh, things mobile, uh, temporarily static so structures that you know come one day and go the next, or they just stay a week or or, or whatever not all necessarily mobile um, but over the years we've developed the same sort of skills that, that uh, deliver brand environments in that mobile and, and semi-static format into the more dedicated locations like Twickenham uh, recently we completely fitted out a, a, a race course that I perhaps shouldn't name because it suggests maybe their, their, their facilities were not up to Twickenham standards but just the client wanted to use the race course environment as a as a uh, an activity, but the rooms, the hospitality rooms, were decorated in such a way that just completely away from the brand. So um, completely fit out to to brand environment, and then put it back a day later to the way it was um, previously. Uh, are we finding in general, and I ask this to all of our panel today, that that, that, that venues with the ability to bring in various types of um, extra elements um, are, are becoming less pigeonholed in terms of what they used to be or people what people used to associate with particular venues. So they would say, well, that venue is such and such a type of venue, so I would host that type of event there. Are we getting people who are thinking a little bit more outside the box when it comes to identifying their venues? Kevin, I can see yeah, you I nodding. People just need to identify space in the right part of the country. So I think it's... I don't think venues have been particularly pigeonholed. I think any venue can be transformed into anything that people want. It just needs the right input from a design side of things and also from the construction side of things. Uh, from a design point of view, I know, Tom, that's, that's something that, that True Staging work quite closely on, isn't it? Is the design element yeah. in advance of an event. How has the development in the advanced design of events helped allow spaces to be opened up as, as event venues? I think it's really helping uh, people understand what they're trying to achieve in an early stage of, of the, the project. Um, it's possible with some fairly simple design tools, uh, SketchUp springs to mind. Even the client can use it to a basic level or, or to an advanced level if they're, they've got someone on board who can fully draw in something like that. Um, that could then be sent around to the individual parties that are part of the project and people can very quickly gain exactly the, the sort of understanding that the client had on their vision for the space. Mm -hmm. So then the vision can just get more and more complex in an early stage. So even if you've got a, a short lead time, you've got the ability to, to pull it off. I think in terms of being pigeonholed, I'll add, add to those, is, is a, it's definitely been opened up. Um, I think maybe say five or so years ago, we, there were events that a sporting or an unusual venue wouldn't have been considered for. Um, even if they had dedicated facilities, now would be. But it, it goes more back to, um, I suppose, storytelling from the events themselves, being able to add a return on investment to the events themselves. But well, I mean, what we try to do, if we've done our job properly, is align our clients' values with that of the RFU and, and try and delve a bit deeper in, under the skin of the events themselves. I think that's where we're no longer pigeonholed. So events that wouldn't have necessarily used a unique venue previously now can, and they are actively driving that and, and making much more use of it. And then that's where these gentlemen, again, either side of me come in and create and, and help tell the stories that they are trying to do, um, trying to tell. People are also on the lookout for that. When you say the unique venue, I mean, Twickenham is a, a unique venue, but also mm. people are trying to find the unusual spaces. They mm. want their event to be special to use an interesting mm. location that, and that I think that's what's opened up a little bit is that people will go to unusual spaces to get that uniqueness themselves and is that is that driven by the, 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 the sheer level of competition that now is in the industry and, and how it's grown perhaps and, and also just trying to to not maybe not go to a similar place that one of your competitors has been to just mm. just to do something different is what everyone kind of strives for and and Robin on the line um, I mean I, I guess you've probably got reference to to experiences of, of, of having worked in some fairly un unusual locations or, or locations that maybe wouldn't be considered instantly as an event site or an event venue? Uh, yes. Um, you know, from, from a cross-section of greenfield sites, some of which are uh, fairly obvious, like, say, Goodwood Festival of Speed, sorry, Goodwood Festival of Speed, 
to a field not far from there, which was um, used as a, a staging post for a four by four arrival um, journey for, for guests. So it was literally setting up a, um, a quality facility in the middle of a almost semi ploughed field. Mm. But um, just quickly, I think it was Kevin, I think, mentioned um, that uh, you know, the space is what the venue is all, of, all about, and we can pretty much, all of us, those of us who are great partners with our clients, do anything anywhere. And I think as an industry, you know, we've become so much more innovative and, and challenging of, of clients, as, as well as being able to um, demonstrate the, the, the depth and breadth of our ex expertise. I think the whole event industry has come alive over the last decade. And um, I personally think that's what's driving, as much as anything, the ability for us all to, you know, to deliver uh, an experience, say, in Twickenham that isn't at all related to rugby. Mm. And, and, and do it with some aplomb. When it, when it comes to the actual hardware, the, the, the physical products that are available now um, from companies like True Staging, Tom, and, and Kevin from Blackout, uh, have your own product portfolios developed to a point now where you're actually able to work within spaces that maybe you couldn't have done 10, 15 years ago or deliver events uh, on a quicker level in terms of turnaround time? I think the turnaround time has increased. I think... Um, we as a company have grown so that we can cater for the amount of business that we get at certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. and it's, as I'm sure Tom will agree and mm -hmm. Matt will agree, it's, there's quiet part times and there's busy times and it's feast and famine at times. So you need to gear up to be able to deal with the levels of business when it's busy. Uh, so I think that's what's improved. Um, but also taking back to Robin's point, it's, it's things, you know, the, the supply companies, things like temporary toilets and things have improved. So it just oh, broadens up the spectrum of places that people can use. Has your own experience as, as a supplier, and, and Tom, th 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 I suppose this is fire to you as well, um, have your own experiences uh, in terms of being able to identify what could be a venue actually helped you prompt an organiser who perhaps has written something off as, as unfeasible in the first instance? I think so, yeah. I think almost anything could be a venue, couldn't it? It's, um, it's probably partly down to budget. How many how many minutes in are we? We yes. mentioned the B word. <laughs> um, one particularly exciting event I was lucky enough to work with Kevin on as well. Um, we were out in Shanghai and we transformed a shipyard with a dusty floor and a roof that was caving in into something that looked like a, a British theatre. Um, it took many months and it was a, a great project, but it's not something you'd be doing every week. You know, it's, uh, it's something. A bit, a bit more out of the ordinary, but it, but it does show you that exactly how you can transform something that you just think, well, that just needs destroying, mm -hmm. to um, to something really quite amazing that all the A-listers will flock to. And, and we, we, we've mentioned the budget word, Matt, and mm. um, we'll br bring you back in on this then. Uh, when an organiser thinks of Twickenham, uh, are, they li uh, are they likely to write it off at the first instance because of budget and they automatically think, oh no, it's, it's far too big and grandiose for me? Uh, no, actually, I, I think um, if they've considered Twickenham, they're already going down the route of quite a bespoke event or an event that has to have some sort of return on investment, has to have a life cycle. So although there will be a finite budget of, of some sort, then no, I think it's almost the reverse. It's, it's, um, it's making sure we are the right venue for their messaging. If we, if we can connect with what they're trying to achieve and what looks like a successful event for them, then they'll consider it. I don't think budget necessarily comes into it at that stage where it does and I suppose where we actually owe again the gentleman either side of me a great deal and all of the, the creative elements of the industry is making certain elements of the events that we run outside of the, the conferencing facilities because that's that is the, the, the easy part of what we do it's purpose built yes it's branded around client events and it's there's some very large productions going to there where it's staging the sets the branding elements of it but it's purpose built for that so but we know we can achieve, or clients and you guys can achieve that anywhere. So where it gets really um, uh, even more important for ourselves is to make the, the unique elements work. So if we're doing something on the pitch side, the staging on the pitch side, utilising the, the LED ribbons, the, the screens, tying all of those creative elements together, making that work, making that come in on budget is the trickier end of it because it's it's... A client coming up with something potentially so bespoke it hasn't been yet mm -hmm. hasn't been done here before, and it's then for again the, the teams we're talking about here to to, del to deliver that. 
that's where the, the budget conversations come in. But at that stage, I think there's been a, a, a lot of detail. If they've considered Twickenham to that extent, we are firmly uh, a venue that can deliver it. It's on message. Twickenham, yeah. Twickenham <coughs> venues like Twickenham, is, um, it's a lot easier for the client to control the budget because, like you say, the facilities are here. Um, you, you they have the package, they know what they're going to get. I think mm. budgets can become slightly more difficult to manage when you go to the sort of brownfield sites where people Quite underestimate the mm -hmm. security, yeah. the facilities for the crew, the how the management are going to work for traffic and things. And I think that's where mm. people maybe lose track of some budgets at times. Whereas in established venues, you know you're going to get a car yeah. park attendant, you know you're going to get infrastructure generally. Yeah, the infrastructure is yes. yeah. always there, which is a great benefit for people coming into places like this. Um, so open to everybody here but uh, my own feeling in, in talking to a lot of people through this podcast and, and through other things connected with event industry news in the last couple of years certainly has been this shift in um, identifying venues people have become more creative in where they're they're hosting their events who is is responsible for driving that creativity is it a collective um, push is it suppliers like a couple of guys that we're all the, the, the three guests that we've got on the show today driving the creativity forward in your own experience and opinions? It might be. So. Sorry. Come on, go, go ahead. Robin, come on in on this. Well, I, I think it's a mixture, to be honest. I think um, just just touching quickly on the budget, because it ha obviously has a big bearing on it. I think budgets are, are stretched now to not just the event, but either side of that and all around it. So the whole journey leading up to the, the, the event itself and, of course, all, all the measurement tools that we all have now have to put in place to to prove uh, the return on the investment mm. um, and I, I think that that is driving choice of venues as well but I think it's all around I think some clients have some great ideas um, they need to be challenged and driven forward in, into sometimes those ideas or push sideways into a realization that you can't actually do that there but you could do this somewhere else and um, I, I think it's coming from a number of areas to be honest would anybody agree that, that looking back eight years ago to the economic downturn, as um, you know, as we may refer to it, uh, uh, did that actually, looking back, have a positive effect on the industry as a whole in terms of allowing event organisers to be a little bit more creative in starting to explore other options by means of actually keeping within tighter budgets, thus driving a little bit more creativity? Mm. No, I'm not sure it was beneficial, but um, I think... It, it may have had an opposite effect. I think it may have, it, it, people may have come at it trying to save money. So you we, we, you end up compromising. Some pe designers is a key one. Pe you know, in the old days, designers would be there for the job and they would be involved and they would be doing the construction drawings and they would turn up on site. And then when budgets started to become tight, you may find that a designer would do a one-off design and then would never be there to consult throughout the pre-production or even on the build. Mm -hmm. Or then a client may then take a similar design and take it onto another event, and then there would be holes in that design because it had been taken from another event. So I'm not, I don't think there's any benefit out of that economic downturn. I think if anything, it kind of people shaved a little bit too much off certain things. And and, and Matt, as as an actual venue, um, mm. who are you working with when it comes to you know when you say that these are my clients, are you working directly with the organisers at the top end of an event? Are you working with agencies with with PR firms with individuals uh, and we're talking at the moment current yeah. uh, luckily a, a broad spectrum completely which uh, um, we have to be in a position to work with a lot of clients directly and we do and there's a lot of partnerships be it any of the top top accountancy firms um, we tend to have business contacts within there but there's no way that we could deliver uh, on the creative w without working with production teams with creative teams so it's it is a very much a broad broad spectrum um, uh, it's I think you uh, it's a conversation away from from this form of a podcast is you mm. need to break it down a little too a little too much for talking about it today but sure yeah um, it, it is a broad spectrum and it's it's multi-layered in terms of um, I think from my perspective it is the middle level of production to creative companies it tends to be my most contact so that would mm. then take in elements of, of creative to make sure it works because we're for the larger uh, events that I would run, which is um, my bread and butter, I suppose, in bringing business in, it tends to be, um, a, say, a 500-person event with a, a quite distinct message which needs to be produced professionally. So you, you, in 
inevitably have to bring in and speak to and help these creative guys deliver what they need to within the venue and take a responsibility for making it work. I'm, go I'm going to shift things a little bit just to reference back a comment that um, I noted fr from earlier on in this episode that you made, Matt, about um, suppliers being able to tie in with in existing infrastructure in a particular um, in a particular venue or site. Um, have, have you seen, uh, and I suppose this is directed to, to Tom and Kevin, the, the shift in, in, in events actually adapting themselves in order to make that integration possible with the, with the services that you offer? Has there been development within the venues themselves? Have you helped drive any development there to allow you to integrate with them a little bit better? Do you mean technically with your equipment? T technically with the actual equipment, yeah, and delivering Ven infrastructure. Venues, venues around Europe are getting um, more equipped with technical equipment. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, a lot of the venues now will have, will, you know, they'll carry house trusts, they'll carry basic equipment, and mm -hmm. there's there's equipment in this venue that's the same. So there are, I think there's been investment made in, in lots and lots of venues across Europe now, which um, which almost makes mine and Tom's involvement less because equipment that we used to supply uh, is now a lot of time in-house but from a, an event organizer that just means you get again going back to the budget it's a more controllable budget element something that can come as part of the package something that comes as part of the, the one-off fee to the venue and, and, and Robin are you finding that the, the, the locations that you're working in have better fixed infrastructure than they perhaps had five ten years ago uh, yes, can't argue that. It, it's not always the right equipment and it's not always um, <laughs> operated by in-house people in the correct way. You know, there's always a role for the, the sort of guys you've got around you there in the studio. And, and, and what, on that subject then, Matt, are, are there people from a, a skill set point of view, are venues uh, uh, like Twickenham bringing on people that are more experienced in certain aspects of event organisation in order to be able to communicate better with suppliers with organizers is that is that something that, that that has been looked at i mean we have partnerships with um, audio visual companies um we have a, an on-site preferred supplier um and yes that that has developed where the ability to communicate with the the outside production companies and, and creative teams to make the events work has definitely increased and we've driven that forward as as really a it, as a must-have to be honest um on, on that subject, I think what, while we're talking then uh, about having um, preferred suppliers and partners that are coming in to do that, we're actually going to do a two-part for this particular subject because we've got a great panel of guests. We've got three guys in the studio. We've got Robin on the line as well. So we're going to wrap up this episode as part one um, and come back to it again with a second episode next week, um, looking a little bit further perhaps at the procurement of suppliers, looking at how those suppliers are taking a more active role with the venues themselves rather than distancing themselves, at the, uh, as I think was the case um, a number of years ago. Um, for this particular episode, we should thank our guests in the studio, Tom Allen from True Staging, Matt Blood from uh, Twickenham, Kevin Monks from Blackout, and joining us on the line, Robin Carlisle, from Mobile Promotions. You can tweet any comments for today's episode at Talking Events. Watch it via the Event Industry News YouTube channel and via eventindustrynews.co.uk. For the time being, you have been listening to Talking Events. Mm -hmm.